it come about that you would end up telling the, the saga of the tours? Uh, it is a saga. It does feel that way. Um, I wanted to tell an L.A. story, and I started kind of with that big umbrella and started looking for uh, a subject or a character that could be my access point into the city. And uh, I started thinking about ni the 90s. Uh, I'm a Point Break fan, you know, so I was thinking about bank robberies. And uh, that then kind of led me to think about high-speed pursuits. And that struck me as a uniquely L.A. Um, uh, phenomenon. And that then, I, then from there, I thought about helicopter reporters. And it doesn't take long then to discover the career of Zoe Turr and Marika Gerard. And they basically invented the form of helicopter journalism, right? Actually, the history of helicopter reporting is dates back to the 1950s. I think it was KTLA that did the first, uh, had the first helicopter, uh, new, news helicopter. But what the TURS did that nobody had quite harnessed was the breaking news element of it. And that then became a genre unto itself. And so in a, in a sense, I would say that they're pioneers of the medium. Now, um you know, were, were they freelance, or did they always work for a particular studio? Or? So they they uh, had a company called the Los Angeles News Service. So rad, uh, local, local, uh, local company. But they they essentially you could probably compare them to the AP on a local scale. And so, but in in reality, that company essentially functioned as a freelance company for any. Uh, uh, network, local network, and they had uh, partnerships with two networks for the most part throughout their career as helicopter reporters, KCOP and uh, KCBS. I feel like these are super, I'm going like deep local news cuts here. Is this no, what you I, need? I, I want you to go deep because <laughs> yeah. it's, this is, you know, the concept of this movie and, and, and of the story that you tell, I mean, is so much the, the heart of it because it's mm -hmm. the story of these two journalists but it's also the story of L.A. in general, but also just news reporting, TV mm -hmm. news reporting, um, and where it's gone the past few decades. Mm -hmm. um, thinking about the tours, you know, yeah, I mean, you, you, you know, there's a scrappy story there, but thinking about them having, like, their own independent news service and everything, there's, like, an element of, like, Nightcrawler about mm -hmm. it as well. There's very much a dark side here. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you go about putting that in your film? I I remember, so I'd been working on the film for about six years, and I think Nightcrawler came out somewhere early on in that phase, and that seems to be people's point of reference often when they hear about uh, uh, news stringers in Los Angeles, and uh, and that's a it's a it's a rad movie, so uh, it's it's a nice comparison. But I think that uh, what what I find what I I think is a departure from that kind of story, other than the Jake Gyllenhaal. Uh, uh, psycho thriller that it turns into is that the uh, this is really a story of a relationship and so I think that um, yes it's about breaking news evolution uh, it's about uh, um, helicopter reporting and it's definitely about Los Angeles but I think at, at its core it's the story of two people who came together and uh, built a life together and so I found that to be kind of the um, the most substantial part of the story. That said, I hope that people all, it, it's a unique way to explore the, uh, a piece of history of Los Angeles and journalism. So, so I do hope that people get that out of it by way of their relationship and their experience. But it is also a story about you know, the transformation of news into mm -hmm. infotainment. Uh, you know, n new, totally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, turning news into entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think the tours ultimately think about that? They'll be the first to tell you that they uh, feel in some way responsible <laughs> for the the direction that news went in. I don't think, though, that I would be so quick to uh, uh, criticize the work they did as that. I think that they were just the best at what they did, and they were eager to and relentless to get the scoop and they did whatever it took to get that story. And so I think that when you talk about 
news is entertainment. I, that's that. Uh, what comes to mind for me immediately is the O.J. Simpson pursuit, and that's really what I see that moment. Uh, I, that's what I see as the significance of that moment in history is when people became glued to the TVs uh, and what was happening was a, a tragedy, you know? And, and they were actually, you know, one of the primary photographers up in the air following the white Bronco. Oh, they were the first on the scene. The first on the scene. First on the scene. Were yeah. there others that joined as well or were, were, was it primarily oh, yeah. just all them? No, so the... There's a moment in the film that I really like where Zoe kind of, it's a simple factoid to deliver, but she, she kind of, I think, really makes us sit with that for a second. She says, we were told that for 20 minutes we had 80 million viewers. And then she, she repeats it, she says, think about that for a moment, 80 million viewers. And so if you want to talk about kind of the realization of news and entertainment and uh, the medium of television, uh, that all happened right there. And, uh, but after those 20 minutes, then you had maybe 15 helicopters on the scene. So it's, it was a, a swarm of helicopters in the sky. Yeah, fascinating. So uh, yeah. Is there something like a, about that chase, such an iconic moment in American media history? I mean, I remember it so vividly. I was eight years old when mm -hmm. it happened, but I was watching. Um, <clears throat> is there something about that that, that that they would say, like, you know, none of, none of those 80 million people watching actually got or understood or something that they, the, only they knew about what was really happening. What was their kind of unique take on it? Yes, exactly. It's interesting because a lot of the film, I try to take you into the experience of the moment that they were, that, if I could say that again, I, I would, the film I was try, trying to take you through the experience as it was happening. And so, I tried not to get too, too much into the storytelling style of all these years later, here's how I reflect on it. I wanted to kind of be much more in the moment. And so I think as a result, there's not a lot of big picture takeaways. And I, and I think that what I hope though is that that leaves something for the audience to really think about um, and kind of uh, try to dissect and understand. And then, you know, it's so fascinating that, you know, their daughter, Katie Turr would go on to have such a celebrated career as an anchor and journalist from MSNBC. W was she involved at all in, in the making of your film? or? Well, she was uh, interviewed for the film. Um, and uh, I thought she brought a really um, important perspective of her parents' story. Uh, and that was the extent in which she was involved in the film. Um, but again, to your point, uh, or to what we were talking about with the experience of telling the story as it unfolded, uh, Katie, for the most part, is telling her story from her memories at that time. And so um, she's not really utilized as an expert as much as she's uh, incorporated as a daughter. Did you have any difficulty with uh, rights issues related to the the photography that they did, the clips that they did, since they ultimately <laughs> sold them, you know, to these stations. Well, they did stations. Oh. And so they, what makes this unique, and this is what I was sort of naive about, and I, I didn't really fully appreciate what I had kind of stumbled into, but Zoe had, throughout her entire career, negotiated a deal that allowed for the networks to broadcast it, but the rights were retained by the TERS. So... As a result, the archive is owned and operated by them. Um, that allowed me to use News Archive in particular, not to mention their incredible personal archival material shot on the same cameras, in a way that a lot of other films can't utilize um, because you know, I think what you're kind of alluding to is, is to license video is a very, um, it can be uh, very expensive. And so the, uh, the one thing I am happy to say that the film provided for the tours, though, is that we were able to digitize their whole archive. So at the time when I first started working on the project, the archive was largely undigitized, still in, on the original beta and three-quarter inch tapes. And those were sitting in a public storage unit in Los Angeles, just sitting there. And so uh, we began that 
adventure. And that's really kind of the beginning of the filmmaking for me was digitizing and looking at the archive. Um, so that was about 3,000 tapes, 2,000 hours of video. So a lot of material. My eyeballs are... 2,000 hours of video. That's that's what we were working with, yeah. <laughs> wow, edited down to like around 100 minutes. That's extraordinary. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot, and there's a lot in there, you know. There's a lot of stuff in there and a lot of... Uh, you know, I was just looking through it recently, um, kind of organizing the archive, and uh, I was just kind of revisiting all these images that I haven't even used that were just beautiful aerials of the city uh, from all different eras. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was, a, it was a, I started with the intention to explore Los Angeles, and their archive provided me with the greatest window into the city I could have hoped for. The, uh, it was the people, though, Zoe and Marika, that I think gave me something a lot more uh, so, uh, um, for me to reflect on and think about and learn from. So, so it was a really incredible um, experience for me to make the film. Yeah.